here. Good afternoon. My name is Ilani Casey, and I'm an enrolled tribal member of the Tlingit Nation Raven Frog Clan, born and raised in Seattle. I'm the board chair of the Nakani Native Program. Nakani is a Tlingit word that means go between. And we are a 501c3 in Seattle. And due to the Stand Up to Oil grant, we're able to do this workshop with Valerie Seagrass. I'm going to do a very brief welcoming song first. Way, 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 ah, hey, way, 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 ah, hey, ah, ha, 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 way, ah, hey, way, ah, hey. Yo, Gunashtish, thank you, Gunashtish. Now here's Valerie Secrets. Good afternoon. And thank you so much, Alani and Jonathan, for coordinating this and um, and just creating the space for me to talk about some of my favorite things. Uh, I feel really lucky today. Uh, and just a brief introduction of myself. My name is Valerie Segrest, and I'm a member of the Muckleshoot Tribe located just south of Seattle, Washington. Um, I've worked for the last oh my gosh, over a decade now uh, with tribal communities, mostly my own, and um, helping to develop food sovereignty strategies. So my background is actually in nutrition, and you'll see me geek out a lot today on um, minerals and vitamins and fun things like that. But I also, I went to school to become a naturopathic doctor. I attended Bastyr University in Kenmore, um, Washington. and um, and it's a pre-med degree, but when I got uh, into my last quarter in school, I had a cup of nettle tea and I very obnoxiously talk about how it totally changed my life. And um, I was sort of struggling through school, I think as a lot of native students do and how you take this very colonized view and, and um, translate it into something that's gonna be applicable in your community. And for me, that cup of tea was the answer. It was like, this is what it's all about. I knew I couldn't sit behind a desk and counsel people on their diets, knowing good and well that they didn't have access to the things that they needed to be able to thrive and survive and heal themselves. And this was a testimony that my elders had really instilled in me. Um, and so I was sort of out in the world trying to really find answers. And uh, I am very, I feel very blessed that plants found me and that, that it's just my job to help share um, help help us all to remember what we already know to be right and true and that's that our the plant people are our greatest teachers and that they're waiting for us right outside the door and that they don't teach us like how I'm going to be teaching today where I'm on t on this zoom thing um talking to you about it but they teach us by emulating uh how we are supposed to be in the world and they do it without a spoken word. And that's, you know, for many of us, some of the most powerful teachings that we can receive. I think about it as, um, I used to say, my mom would give me this look and I just knew I better act right. <laughs> and now I'm working on that with my own daughters. Just that spoken word, right? No spoken word. And, uh, and so how do we, I think as Coast Salish people, as indigenous people, we see this, we see how our foods and our medicines show up in our lives and how they um, shape the world in which we live in and how for thousands of years or since time began, we have organized our lives around our traditional foods and medicines and our food systems. Um, and so I, I went out to do more of that work, uh, helping people strategize how to increase access to their traditional foods and medicines, how to remember their teachings, how that applies in a modern world, in a modern lifestyle, um, and, you know, really trying to take a real common sense approach to it all in a, in a really practical way. So, Anyways, with that, I'm going to get started here because I, I only have an hour and I could talk about this for four hours, especially with social distancing. <laughs> I'm missing it. Um, but I really love teaching and, um, and so I'm really grateful to have given, been given this opportunity today. 
Uh, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end so that we can uh, talk about any address any questions that you may have. And um, I believe after this, we're going to, this is being recorded so people can watch it again. And I'm going to cite some resources that uh, you can uh, get some of this stuff online. We've actually created a book, um, a little cookbook that goes along with a lot of these things. And there's some posters and some curriculum set links online too. So those things will all be, um, they are accessible and you can access them. So that's a little bit about me. And so I've been asked today to talk about traditional foods and medicines. Um, it's sort of all the, it's uh, been this movement that's been really uh, an honor to witness happen. And time and time again, I see how, um, how foods, our traditional foods are our organizing tool, how they inspire us, um, that they're not just resources, you know, to be extracted from the land, but that they're our relatives and uh, in so many ways, you know, help shape the world in which we live in. And so um, we try, I have a, a really cool, fun group of women and, and some men, the educators that I get to develop this stuff out with and think about the strategies. My newest job is working for the Native American Agriculture Fund. Um, I'm the regional director of Native Food and Knowledge Systems. And we actually have um, a grant cycle open right now. It closes June 1st, but our whole goal and charge is to really help um, uh, help native farmers, ranchers, fishermen, harvesters, native food producers to become more successful in our food system. And that really is providing a way in which we can help shape that food system. And so we're taking it very seriously. And I'm really, I feel so blessed to work with the people that I do. There are so many good people out there doing amazing work, um, advocating and protecting our, our lands and our waters for our future. Um, so I always want to remember that. So for me, um, working with tribal food sovereignty as a, a sort of method and mechanism in which we can get to a place where people have adequate access to nutrition, um, that I think has a lot to do with some of the issues that are coming up around pipelines and oils and standing up to gas and uh, standing up to oil, like uh, Jonathan and Alani have been really helping to organize and raise awareness around with their program. And, um, and so what does that actually mean? Tribal food sovereignty has so many different definitions. And so this is sort of, you know, as a person witnessing this movement over the last decade, uh, these are the things in which um, help us sort of think about it and look through this lens of food sovereignty. So having access to healthy and culturally uh, appropriate foods. Um, grow, gathering, hunting, and fishing in ways that are maintainable over the long term. Distributing foods in a way so that people um, get them, so uh, get what they need to be to stay healthy and um, utilizing tribal treaty rights whenever possible to uphold um, policies that ensure continued access to traditional foods. Oops. And then to adequately compensate the people who are in the food system as well. So a lot of, I see a lot of these um, programs coming out that are really based in volunteer work, which is amazing. And volunteer work can be so powerful. But when we're talking about instigating change in a food system, we also have to consider the, um, the totally stark inadequacies of our food system. I think that's sort of uh, you know, what is going on right now with this pandemic and how it's just illuminating all of the problems that, um, that were always there and <laughs> that you know, groups and probably thinkers like everybody here today has been uh, really advocating for for a long time that um, I'm hearing a lot of, I just can't wait to get back to normal. And for many indigenous communities, normal was not okay. And so we have this sort of, you know, not to 
lighten the subject or anything, but there is a silver lining going on here where we can start to strategize um, how the new normal looks and um, how it can be more beneficial to all and be more considerate of all of the of the um, elements in, in which it's going to take for us to be able to live a healthy life and that means you know respecting people respecting place respecting the environment that we live in and also honoring our history that as we move towards a new food system to feed the future it's you know abundance or detriment depends on how well we honor our old ancient food system and that's something i see time and time again with these pipelines going through um uh you know traditional lands that have been managed for a long time so uh what's and i'm wondering if people are seeing what i'm seeing and then it's you can't see what i'm <laughs> trying to work zoom out in my life here okay so strengthening social fabric and just to give you some ideas around how plants teach us um when i think about food sovereignty and the um, implications of it all i think about how uh, we have this opportunity to strengthen our social fabric and cedar tree is really the best um, for me uh, one of the teachings of cedar trees is how to strengthen social fabric and um, in the northwest we call we call the cedar tree long life giver or a grandmother tree because it provides everything we need to um, to really thrive on the land and and in our lives so the everything from the bark to the um, cedar scales the leaf are filled with medicine there are basketry materials our weaving materials our art forms our transportation the inner bark was used as baby diapers um, there are clothing and the the cedar leaf can actually be um, chopped up and infused into an oil and used topically as a medicine you can this incredible engineering design that's nowhere on the also on the planet where you can take cedar planks and um and roll them into boxes and that's what you're seeing on the the right hand side that um boxes that can hold water they were used to store foods they are used to store foods and you can also boil water in them which is something that I really, really love to do. I'm such a geek. I'm usually telling people how excited I am going to boil water in the box today. <laughs> but you fill it with water and let it sit for a while. And then you heat up your hot volcanic rock and drop it in one at a time. And then all of a sudden, this magical moment happens where the whole thing bursts into a rolling boil. And then you throw in your, your um, vegetables or whatever it is that you're wanting to cook in there and cover it and let it sit and steam for about 45 minutes and it makes the most beautiful ashy you can't you can't replicate it on a stove top that's for sure but that um the amount of time it takes to boil the water in the box takes the same amount of time as if you were to just boil water on the stove so it's actually pretty efficient um Anyways, it's one of my favorite things to do. And I think it's, you know, just another example of how impressive cedar tree is that uh, it just teaches us time and time again how to, you know, push our roots into this earth and hold it together and uh, be medicine for the land and for those who have yet to come. Um, I also wanted to talk about this idea of a cultural ecosystem. Uh, typically, as humans, we, we're in this practice of looking at, at the land and observing the land, but leaving out in our findings and reports and all those things, our reflections, our own, um, our own place in that system. And so cultural ecosystems are physical manifestations of landscapes and the processes and relationships that are um, required that... Um, that without human involvement the uh the pristine you know uh landscape 
would have been wouldn't have been as manipulated i guess so there's this thought process in a lot of um uh, environmental movements and conservation efforts that every time you know a human being steps into nature they wreck everything around them but that is not how our ancestors showed up on the land that there was uh, a, a very meticulated and perfected process over time that was essentially gardening and maintaining the wild um, I'm, I don't like to you know split hairs over language but when we when we say things like foraging and harvesting it sort of um, puts this picture in our mind that people are like out there you know stumbling around the woods and harvesting what they can find off the forest floor or harvesting off of the trees or whatever um, but actually a lot of these are, are forest gardens uh, that you know, at, when Captain Vancouver sailed into the Puget Sound, he wrote in his in his journal that he had never seen a piece of land so untouched by man. And what he didn't know is that he was looking at very well maintained Coast Salish gardens. That there are forest gardens, there are shellfish gardens, there are kelp forests, um, huckleberry meadows, camas prairies. That these places were burned, pruned, coppice. They were uh, grafted, they were maintained. Uh, you would do, you know, small practices around uh, harvesting huckleberry, making sure that the wild strawberry trailed up the bottom of it, that there were, um, it didn't sound like agriculture, it doesn't look like Mr. McGregor's garden, but it totally is. That these are, are the places that we maintain. And, uh, and that is really important to bring light to because you know, a lot of our berry patches and prairies are paved over for um, for oil, for corporate, um, you know, expansion, for urban sprawl and all of those things. And they, in turn, we experience these invisible losses of places in which we would be out, you know, maintaining and taking care of. So, um, I think that's really important to remember. Also that we can help address uh, issues and help stand up to oil by strengthening our local economies. And I think that this is true now more than ever. What I'm witnessing in the, um, the food distribution and relief efforts are really people taking pre-existing infrastructures and remodeling them to become regional food distribution centers uh, or distribution efforts. And that is so important. If we're gonna, you know, some people are predicting that this is gonna go on another 18 months or so. And one of the major lessons we can learn from it is that the food supply chain disruption has everything to do with shipping our food long distances and not honoring local economies or you know, putting effort into local meat processing centers or local food processing centers or even smaller distribution efforts that can accept 20,000 pounds of potatoes and 15,000 pounds of onions <laughs> that are coming into our community. It takes an effort to do that, but the blessing that's coming out of it is that people are cannot um, blindly disregard the issue of uh, how truly food insecure we are in this country by uh, op continuing to operate in this um, this system engineered for uh, our food to be traveling long distances. It's just really insane. And I think Alder Tree teaches us how to use resources in the best way possible. Um, the after forest lands have been cleared, one of the first uh, species that populates uh, the, that area, disturbed areas, are the alders. And uh, alders are actually there to sort of fix the soil and get the soil ready for future uh, growth around the next succession of forest. And so they're doing this by um, pulling using oxygen and working with a fungus called Frankia, a bacteria called Frankia, um, to push more uh, 
carbon and nitrogen back into the soil. So it actually helps balance soil health to get it ready for the evergreen tree succession to come in. Um, I think that is, I mean, in permaculture, you would call that stacking, you know, uh, function on function. And that is what we what we can learn how to do better in our life. And I think what these regional food economy shifts are doing, where we're seeing an opportunity to create space and jobs and use existing infrastructure to be able to get more fresh uh, produce and local uh, farm products into our communities, which is pretty cool. Also to remember to live with the seasons. Um, I think when we live with the seasons, we're more likely to uphold that whole local economy stuff. Um, uh, right now we're seeing Camas prairies uh, going off here in the Northwest. And Camas prairies actually used to be so abundant you could walk through them from Northern California all the way into Canada. Uh, nowadays we call it the I-5 corridor. But they were, um, when Lewis and Clark came into the Chehalis Valley, they thought they were looking at a body of water. But what they didn't know is they were looking at a camas in full bloom, which only happens about three weeks out of the year, starting right around Mother's Day or somewhere in that, in that time frame. So it's happening right now. For those of you in Washington State, you can just drive south on the I-5. And when you get to about uh, just south of Olympia, you'll start seeing these blue flickers along the roadside. Um, I think Joint Base uh, Lewis McCord also has uh, a canvas patch, but I've never actually noticed it from the I-5. So anyways, um, now less than 3% of our traditional camas prairies are still intact because as you know, the I-5 corridor is heavily populated. And <clears throat> because it only blooms for a couple of weeks out of the year, people don't really know that, um, that it is there. They're just thinking they're looking at, you know, grass, grassy prairies, I guess. Um, but it's important, this is really an important ecosystem and it's a great example of a cultural ecosystem because it was brought here via glacier about 10,000 years ago. Um, if you could imagine standing in downtown Seattle with a, a glacier a mile over your head, that is what the Pacific Northwest used to look like. And this glacier would retreat and come back and retreat and come back and the salmon would go with it. And these canvas bulbs were brought here um, and embedded into this glacial till. Now without human intervention of harvesting that canvas or burning the prairie or making sure that the, that the edges were maintained, the prairies would have been swallowed up by um, conifer trees a long time ago. And so every time I'm out one of these prairies, I'm always thinking about how my, my ancestors have maintained these gardens for 10,000 years. And, um, and as we're all planting gardens now, uh, these sovereign gardens or um, whatever you want to call them, be thinking about that, you know, be thinking about how you are, you are like the alder tree preparing the soil, how many seeds are, are under the soil just waiting for you to tend and help maintain and create an environment where that seed feels like it has a chance, you know, to take a chance at life, that it uh, sends out that taproot and sprouts out. And I think that's our work. That's our work right now. How do we create an environment where the, the next generation feels confident enough to go be an advocate, to know uh, what it means to be a steward and of what? Um, that's why this work is so important, all the work that you're doing to protect, to protect the environment. But also when you're living with the seasons, you begin to become seasonally attuned. And I always think about my daughters when I think about this. This is Gia on the left and Mazzy on the right poking the dandelion and uh, how they get excited when certain things are coming out because my children are a lot like me. Um, they're completely different people when they're outside, and so we spend a lot of time outside um, and wondering and 
walking them through, you know, what it is to philosophize about the environment, thinking about it and how we treat plants and identifying plants. Um, it's our human superpower to be able to look at something and know the name for it and know what it's used for. Think about a Starbucks logo or a Pepsi sign or the McDonald's arches. You know what it is and what it's used for. It's the, it's the power we have to be able to get behind, get in a, in a vehicle and turn it on and drive it down the road because we have those human processes that help, that remember how to use things. That um, can also be applied by uh, plants. And, you know, when I first started really learning about plants, I thought I would never, this, there's so much to learn. There's so much green in the forest around here. It's overwhelming. Um, but it turns out, you know, the average human can, the average actually kid, this Mazzy's um, going to be seven, the average seven-year-old can name up to a thousand logos in corporate um, corporate marketing schemes <laughs> and, and fewer than five native plants. And so I really wanted my children to learn along with me and um, and know their plants. And now I'm I'm really proud to to say that you know they can identify uh Mazzy is up to I don't know in the several dozens and can tell you what they're used for. Um, we've been doing a lot of uh, connecting with our senses. So having them uh, blindfold them and then do a smell um, exam on, you know, is this, and the really smelly fun stuff like peppermint and lavender and, um, and cedar leaf to see, you know, how we get in touch with using all of our senses and all of our human superpowers. But when you're really uh, eating those seasonal foods, you also get attuned to what's going on in the seasons. And that's pretty cool. Um, also eating local foods minimi minimizes obviously our environmental impact. And, um, and I think about cattails when I think about environmental impacts because they are these natural um, environmental toxin uptakers like they they like to clean areas which is really great and such a blessing but also if you're harvesting cattail you want to really make sure that you're harvesting it from a clean area so that um, your body will react quite quickly if you are exposed to some of the environmental toxins that the cattails are are taking up um, and I love this quote from Robin Wall Kimmerer that says, in some native languages, the term for plants translates to those who take care of us. Through natural selection, the cattails develop sophisticated adaptations that increase their survival in the marsh. The people were attentive students and borrowed solutions from the plants, which increased their likelihood of survival. The plants adapt and the people adopt. So beautiful. Um, and then also by eating more local foods, we are um, able to really take up the nutritional density of, of plants and, um, or anything local. Typically, uh, I think about a blueberry that has traveled, you know, a really long distance. In the dead of winter around here, I find New Zealand blueberries in the store. And I love New Zealand. I've never been there. I've always wanted to go. I'm nothing against it, and, but I do feel sad for that little blueberry. For those of you who have traveled on a plane long distances before, like think about how you felt getting off the plane. You're like dehydrated and bedraggled and you need to take a shower. And that's how that poor bedraggled blueberry feels. And then we're trying to eat it and get the best um, medicine out of it. Really, um, depending on where you're tuning in from, blueberries are pretty easy to grow. And um, you can literally put them in a pot right outside your door and just harvest it and eat it. And you're getting all the vitality of it right at the peak of the seasons. You're going to get more, uh, as soon as you pluck, you know, something from its life source, it begins to lose its vitality. And so by eating more local foods uh, and more fresh or even 
you know, prioritizing harvesting for yourself at least and maybe a little bit for somebody who couldn't uh, afford to get out to that space you are making sure that you're gonna um, take in the best amount of nutrition and that's pretty cool and so i this i have two slides with numbers so here they come um, I really love this table that was put together by the Center for World Indigenous Studies because it shows us, uh, you know, the, the lack of nutrients that we're getting in just even a standard American diet. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about these nutrients through the next several slides. But vitamin C, for example, if you were to look at the current U.S. intake, which is uh, 74.4 milligrams and the uh, nut nutrient guidelines for Americans this is what all standards are set at so all food boxes all snap programs all all the dipper programs they're all based off of these numbers and that's what they are trying to maintain even the school lunch did I say school lunch programs I think so um, they're trying to get to these numbers but we know good and well that that the average American is not meeting most of those. Um, we're, looks like we're doing pretty good with zinc, but I like to pay attention to things like calcium and magnesium because osteoporosis is such an issue, but also the symptoms of magnesium deficiency are actually the same symptoms as um, pre-diabetics or, dia or type 2 diabetes. And <clears throat> what we know is that if you live a life where you're not, your entire life, you're not meeting a standard of any of these, then you are predisposed and more likely to get um, uh, chronic nutrition-related diseases that are totally preventable. So what's interesting to me is that, that these guidelines are not always culturally appropriate, because if you look at my ancestor, my Coast Salish ancestral diets, and these numbers are based off of sort of common sense around what would people be eating in this area and how incredibly nutrient dense our, our traditional foods are and our local foods are. Um, the comparison is sort of shocking. It's kind of like a no brainer why uh, diabetes and heart disease and um, cancers and uh, chronic inflammation would be such an issue in our communities because we're looking at, um, you know, vitamin C, for example, my ancestors had 604 milligrams estimated a day, and the standard uh, American guideline is just 65 to 90 milligrams. Um, and the average, the average U.S. citizen is is 96 percent are about are getting that. But if you were to look at um, the percentage of uh, Americans that were getting it based on an ancestral diet, only 12% would be getting that vitamin C. Vitamin C is really important to not just boosting our immune systems, but carrying out the, the free radicals or toxins that are in our body and, um, and reversing the aging process and turning off all of our inflammatory markers in our body so that we are more likely to stand up to viruses and bacteria and any kind of disease that sort of uh, thrives in infla inflammatory um, processes in our body. So uh, this is really important to me. I think it's uh, a pervasive issue that people uh, really need to start paying more attention to and I'm hoping to be writing some more articles about that in the in the next coming months to push out. But um, magnesium and calcium are another uh, severely under uh, under eaten nutrient. And then if you look at our wild foods nutrients, it's sort of like, here's the remedy, right? Um, so looking at nettle, for example, so in just one cup of nettle, we're getting 2,900, oops, we're getting 2,900 milligrams of calcium. The, um, the dietary guideline is asking for 800 milligrams a day. So you're getting, I mean, you don't have to eat a whole lot of this stuff. Um, just one cup of nettle tea actually will meet your um, half of your calcium intake for the day and all of your magnesium. 
so just you know sort of pushing on to the point that our wild foods are incredibly nutrient dense they are um, cultivated you know they can be cultivated because we're out there harvesting and paying attention to them and, and hopefully harvesting in a good way where we're not taking more than we need you know the general um, goal is to make it look like you were never there um, or only taking about 10%, keeping in mind that you're gonna to have to go home and process all of it. And the processing and uh, storing away properly takes like 10 times longer than it does to actually harvest this, these um, many, of the, many of the crops. So, okay, numbers are done, I swear. <laughs> I have to look at those anymore. Um, but anyways, just to drive home the point of how important it is to eat local foods, and to remember, this is one of our traditional food uh, diet principles that um, my colleague Elise Crone and I developed, uh, that plants breathe, drink water, and absorb nutrients. And after they're plucked from their life source, they begin to lose their vitality. And so the fresher the food, the better it is for you. Eating local foods supports our local economy and protects the environment by reducing the amount of fossil fuels used to transport food far distances. And then we like to put these little um, sort of like intentional uh, statements in there, something that you can write down and put on your mirror, or, you know, carry around with you and try to remember. But when I choose local foods, I help grow a strong regional food system and I taste the bounty of the land to which I belong. So have fun with that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, really what this, uh, you know, people who are drawn to the messaging of Nakani Native, I think about you as being um, protectors. And uh, like the wild rose teaches us to protect what we love. I think about that um, beautiful quote about how there are roses of many colors and they all have really wicked thorns. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it teaches us to to really embrace grace and beauty and inspires love in so many ways. But those thorns remind us that we also have to protect that. And um, nothing is more, I think, relevant in this conversation than water protectors and, uh, and the colonial impacts on our water. And so um, some of the issues that have uh, come up and, and Jonathan actually sent me this really great article on the environmental impacts of, and food sovereignty um, issues that arise with uh, energy projects that uh, really disproportionately impact indigenous people. And that that is what we see time and time again with the colonial impacts on water, that it creates a mistrust of our water supply. Um, I've seen this actually happen in my own community and um, it also disrupts management practices and vast and creates vast pollution and um, reduces control and access to water, which is a major issue. So um, something to think about, good old Beyonce, um, that in 2004, the beverage industry actually spent $2 billion on advertising alone, targeting ages 2 to 17. And uh, this is, I'm transitioning here into talking about medicine teas and why like maybe you can't go to the store and you're not a person who wants to eat all the salads in the world to try to get all the nutrients you need that I was <laughs> pitching in those in those um, tables before but you don't have to because um, all we really need to do is drink more water and also put plants in water to be able to have beautiful medicinal beverages that boost all those nutrient values in our life. And, um, but what the soda industry does is so counterproductive. It actually moves into these uh, communities and lowers the water table by the production practices that they're putting into place. And then preaches this, you know, uh, overwhelming marketing plan talking about how um, their sugary beverages are good for people and 
look, if you drink that amount of Pepsi, you'll look like Beyonce. Like, do you really think she drinks that amount of Pepsi? I don't think so. Um, and that there's really uh, a lot of this stuff is really effective and, <clears throat> and does nothing for our health, specific, especially for tribal communities or indigenous communities. And according to figures from the beverage industry, soda companies produce 10.4 billion gallons of soda each year. And that's being drawn from our water table. That is enough to serve every American a 12 ounce can every day, 365 days per year. And that is actually um, the amount of water that pours over Niagara Falls in four hours. So um, pretty crazy. This is coming, the, the next um, bit of slides you'll see, they're coming out of a native infusion curriculum that Elise and I, Elise Crone and I wrote. It's available for download online at the First Nations Development Institute website. But you can also, I'm pretty sure you can just Google Native Infusion Rethink Your Drink and the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board also has the full curriculum downloadable online. Um, there's also posters that I'm going to go through here. There are six of them. They were done by, um, the artwork was done by Joe Seymour and Roger Fernandez, two Coast Salish artists, and um, Elise and I worked pretty hard on trying to pull together just simple teachings from each plant. And really it's meant to be a counter marketing campaign and you'll see why, but they, these posters can be ordered at chatlinbooks.com and I'll put the, the link is on the last page. And then the recipes that go along with every one of the plants I'm going to cover are also in the um, Feeding Seven Generations Salish Cookbook. And the cookbook's like six or seven dollars. The posters are super cheap too. We're not getting a profit off of it. We're just um, recouping costs to print and ship and administrative fees. So the first one, and this is how it all began, was um, we were hearing the, the protest, the no dapple stuff was going on, and we were hearing a lot of water is life. And as practicing health practitioners in our communities, we were thinking, yeah, water is life and people should probably just drink more of it. Especially now when we're in a time where we just really need to fortify our immune systems, the best way to do that is to keep your mucosal linings good and hydrated by making sure that you're drinking enough water every single day. Water is absolutely life. It is this amazing element in our world that you know, travels through the ethers and the ecosystems up to the stars and collects stardust and then falls back down and slips around rocks and turns into rivers and reflects the beautiful sky and trees above. It is, and then we have to drink it to live. Like, what a blessing. What an amazing opportunity we have as humans to, you know, really humble ourselves to something that's been here since time began. Um, it's one of our most important spiritual medicines. And as one of my favorite people in the world, Kimberly Miller from Skokomish says that you have to ask for it. You have to ask for its healing. Um, that the morning dew from the Ford's, uh, sword fern and the rain and even the water we drink every day purifies us and cleanses us. It's precious. Water is precious and so are you. And so you really have to ask for its healing and, um, and make sure you humble yourself enough every day to drink enough. It makes up 60 to 70% of our body weight, which is similar to trees. I love that. And, um, and men has many essential roles for our mind, body, and spirit. It carries nutrients, it removes waste, it cools the body, digests food, repairs and replaces old tissues, and it's cushion for the organs and joints. And right now, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm really concerned for our young, our young ones and this um, isolation. We don't know what the ramifications of it will be in the future, but we do know that socializing is very important for, um, for our children, for social development. And so I'm trying to think of all the ways in which I can spend quality time with my children um, doing something meaningful, spending one-on-one -on -one time with them even. And so my um, five-year-old Gia and I go out every week and we visit our mountain spring and collect water. And then that's what we're drinking through the week. And she looks forward to it every single time. She gets, um, it. Fall, it's really cold glacier water that comes out <laughs> and she gets all excited about sticking her head under the water. So um, 
And so I'm just trying to really, you know, celebrate something with her, but also kind of just spend time doing something, getting into a new practice and, um, and still, you know, uh, really honoring that special time for her. So I hope that we're all thinking about that with our little ones right now. Um, and then if you're in the Northwest or even, I don't know, probably, well, no, probably not the Midwest. I think that there was still snow there a couple weeks ago. Um, the evergreen tree tips are coming out. So that's that bright green fluorescent flicker that you're seeing um, driving down the road or walking on your, um, on your walks outside. But Doug firs, the Douglas firs are pushing out their new little tips and those are actually really edible. You can snap them off. Kids love to harvest them and, um, and just eat them fresh, or you can infuse them in water. They make a really delicious sun tea. And, um, and then you can also just, you know, make evergreen um, tree tip tea, hot or cold. Uh, we like to, I personally like the Doug fir the best. And we like to mix our tea with um, lemonade and seltzer water, like e equal parts lemonade, bubbly water, and um, Doug fir tea. And it tastes sort of like a piney squirt. It's really delicious. And it's really high in vitamin C and electrolytes. Um, totally fun to drink. And our counter marketing campaign is that it's nature's original thirst quencher. We couldn't call it nature's thirst quencher because Gatorade would probably sue us. But it's better than Gatorade. You don't get any flame retardants in it. It's amazing. <laughs> Go out and harvest your Doug fir tips. Um, Wild Rose is also out right now. And I just actually wrote an article on five ways to eat a rose. It's in the Yes magazine for this month, the um, May-June edition. Uh, we can, I can probably ask Jonathan or Alani to send out that link to everybody. But it um, very clearly just, you know, talks about how to put it in a honey, how to put it in a vinegar, how to make a tea, how to dry it, how to make rosehip jam. It's all right there. So wild rose, like I said, it helps us uh, remember to what is precious and how to keep it safe from harm. And the sweet smelling flowers soothe irritation, heal wounds, and add delicious flavor to food and drinks. In the fall, flowers become rosehips, which strengthen our heart and contain vitamin C, shielding us from illness. Uh, so the counter marketing theme for this is that it's naturally enriched <laughs> that um that the bioflavonoids actually support um and address chronic inf inflammation in our body and um and that they're really i don't know how many of you spend time with roses but like now's the time to really stop and smell the roses the bees are doing it and um and they're in their prime. So you can eat them fresh, you can infuse them in a sun tea and add lemonade, make, um, impress all your friends, you can put them in honey. And um, on the left here I have rose hips, which, uh, so when you harvest the rose you just want to pinch off the petals and leave that base in there so that uh, the ovary of the flower will get fertilized and swell up and that's flower sex 101 and that's how most fruit happens actually um, and that's what a rose hip is it's a fertilized ovary of a rose and just three of those have the same amount of vitamin c as an entire orange plus iron um, and for those of you nutrition geeks out there uh, in order to absorb iron you have to have vitamin c so it's really perfect in china they actually use these to purify the blood and in France, this is their, um, their cough syrup go-to remedy. In fact, in World War II, they were treating scurvy with rose hips over there because of the food shortages that were going on. So um, they have a long-standing tradition of medicine all around the world. Roses are 35 million years old. So they can really teach us about how to survive and thrive on this planet if we know how to catch their, their wisdom and what they're trying to show for us. Wild strawberries are another um, inspiration for us. They remind us to taste the seasons. We talked about seasonal attunement already, so I'm not going to geek out on that anymore. But they, you know, remind us to embrace and savor the moment. 
and these berries are really small, the wild ones, uh, as opposed to like those big meaty flavorless ones you get in the store, <laughs> those little tiny wild strawberries are like tiny little fruit snacks that pack this big punch of flavor. I can never actually harvest any to bring home because I usually just sit down and eat them right off of the, the ground wherever I'm at. Um, but you can also harvest the leaf and make strawberry leaf tea. And that is um, the, the, the leaf of berries, wild berries, has the same medicine as the berry, the fruit itself. The only thing that you're not getting is the fiber, right? So um, most berry leaves are anti-inflammatory, strawberries in particular. If you just go to the N National Institute of Health website and type in strawberries and diabetic, um, a whole bunch of articles will come up around um, how it is an anti-diabetic food. And so they're really high in minerals and antioxidants and have an affinity to um, to healing women in particular and uh, the blood, extra blood vessels that we have feeding our uterus and our uterine lining. Um, so it has an affinity for that. And, uh, and yeah, get out and harvest your, <laughs> your strawberries. Oh, there they are. I forgot to put this in here. See how tiny it is? It's so cute and so easy to grow. Um, out here we have we have uh, huckleberries, actually over 13 different varieties that grow here in the Puget Sound region. And uh, time and time again, it just reminds me that food is our medicine. That uh, huckleberries help us to live a long and vibrant life. And, um, and people, just as we would organize our lives around fishing uh, for salmon, we would also organize ourselves around when huckleberries were in bloom. And we still do, actually. Um, every year. My birthday is September 1st, and that's typically huckleberry harvesting time. So guess what we do for my birthday every single year? <laughs> We're out harvesting, following that, um, that season as it ripens, that, that plant as it ripens through the seasons, and, and also making sure that we harvest enough to bring back to somebody who may not have the um, opportunity to be able to get out and, and get it done. So, uh, Overall, berries are really great for your health because they provide antioxidants, which help sort of clean up all the natural processes in our bodies that, um, that create cell damage. Our bodies are constantly building ourselves up and then breaking things down. And, um, but what we find often in our modern world with um, being inundated with oil uh, and oil industry or environmental toxins is that our toxin um, uh, holding in our body is a lot higher than it has been historically. And so we need antioxidants now more than ever. And, um, and plants have a lot of antioxidants in them, specifically berries, and even more so with our wild berries. They're really high in vitamin C, um, which ha we all know why we need more vitamin C, C especially right now, and then fiber and how important that is for maintaining gut health. So obviously you're not gonna get the fiber component out of drinking the berry tea. Um, I guess you could eat the leaves, but that probably wouldn't taste very good. So, um, but you're also getting the vitamin C and the antioxidants from that. And that's our counter-marketing campaign that they build strong veins for generations. And then finally, we've got my first plant teacher, my favorite one of all, um, nettles. And I'm going to try not to, let's see, I've got 36 minutes. I'm going to try not to talk about them for 36 minutes. Um, hopefully I did a good job. So nettles teach us to build strength. And um, they're nature's springtime superfood, you know, helping to really help us seasonally attune to what's happening. So typically we're coming off of a really, um, uh, let's see, like dried meats, dried berries, like preserved foods diet, which gets us through the season and that's, and they're really nutritious and, and great for us, but they're also really hard on our guts. And so um, as seasonal changes happen, I really love to do uh, plant uh, detoxes. So I'll take on a certain plant and nettle is always my springtime go-to. Um, 
not only does it is it the first like green flicker on the forest floor it's the first springtime food that comes out but because it's so high in um, crucial minerals that help build our blood and has uh, an affinity to the liver and the kidneys to gently detoxify it's helping to support us and in, in helping to build our strength um, in many cultures, we talk about how the blood is the energy force in our body and uh, nettle does a good job at fortifying our blood. And so it helps us build that strength so that we can you know, live out all of the dreams that we had for ourselves in that winter slumber time and all of the promises we made to ourselves for New Year's resolutions that you need that stamina to be able to get, get those things accomplished. Nettle is your plan. So, one cup of uh, nettle leaf tea is 300 milligrams of calcium. It's 29 times higher in calcium, eight times higher in magnesium, and 12 times higher in iron than spinach. Can you even imagine what would happen to Popeye if he had a cup, just one cup of nettles? He would just like probably shoot into outer space, just freak out. Uh, I like to think about that. So it's our uh, nature's original energy energy drink is our counter marketing slogan for it, and um, and I just think it's one of the most wonderful plants. I uh, so useful in so many ways. Right now, it's looking a lot more like this um, this picture on the left here. It's taller, and so you would want to harvest the leaf and dry it for tea. So once nettle. Nettle is a fiber and as it grows, it gets more fibrous and it's one of the strongest fibers on the planet. And so you don't wanna be, you know, chewing on, um, on fresh stinging nettle when it's this tall. Um, and actually you really don't wanna like pick it and eat it immediately either because it has a sting and, but the sting is just this tiny little drop of acid that doesn't stand up very well to heat. So as long as you dry it or pan fry it, like sauteed greens or toss it into a soup, it won't sting you. The, the, uh, uh, the sting is actually denatured like really quickly. Um, but right now you're gonna clip those leaves into a brown paper bag or a basket and then every day sort of toss them around and within a week, two weeks at the most, they'll dry out and you can use those to make a tea, a cup of tea. So um, get outside and spend time with your nettles. Uh, some other things we talk about in the curriculum that I don't have time to cover today is um, how water is the universal solvent, how it draws medicine out of things, but also helps to clear our, our own bodies of unwanted um, things and helps you know lubricate our system so that um, bacteria and viruses can't just like, you know, pitch a tent there all summer. Um, we, you can also get more information around harvesting and um, storing your own tea plants. Uh, we have a section in it on natural sweeteners and uh, did a lot of research on this around natural sweeteners in particular because of the sugary beverage industry and that was the purpose of our the original intent of our um, of our curriculum and we talk about the difference between what an herbal infusion is which is where you would take your um, take your plants and then put them in water and let them sit for up to eight hours like I like to do that with nettles so at night I'll bring a pot of water to a boil I'll throw a handful of nettles in there and let it sit on the stove for up to eight hours and then uh, <clears throat> and take it off the heat um, and then I strain it out and I have a really rich uh, nettle nectar that allows that mineral rich plant to just give up its medicine for a little bit longer versus a tea that's where you would take uh, your water, bring it to a boil, take it off the heat, put your plant in it, and it would be there for 15 minutes. Now, some people, that's just how they do it, and that's totally fine. You can make nettle tea in 15 minutes. That's fine, too. And then there's decoctions, which is specific for um, harder barks and berries and roots, where you put the root in cold water 
and then bring that up to a boil together and then simmer it for uh, up to 20 minutes, tip 10 to 20 minutes, and then remove it from the stove and pour it off. They need just a little bit extra energy to pull that medicine out. And so um, we talk about those different methods. We also talk about how to make your own soda because a lot of people have some transitioning to do off of the, the sugary um, soda beverages and also how to make herbal ice cubes. There's another section in there on bone broth, which is absolutely my favorite thing to talk about. Um, I like to call it bone tea because that's exactly what it is. You just take these otherwise disregarded parts of, um, you know, a free range chicken or the bones and you boil them and put all those vegetables that are in your crisper um, in your fridge that maybe you had a lot of ambition you know, in the, in your grocery shopping, you're going to eat all those carrots and celery and they're just still sitting there in your crisper, <laughs> toss them in a pan, toss them in a pot, um, put some bones in there and simmer it for up to 24 hours. Bone broth is the elixir that brings life back into things and is so healing for our guts um, and can be hidden into a lot of things that, you know, when I was first trying to get my children to, um, to get more bone broth in their diet, we would just put put it into a soup or um, a porridge or something like that and have them, have them eat it that way. And then there's also a section we wrote on smoothies in there. And so all these healthy beverages, all these ancestral recipes that have been perfected and defined over time and then with very um, strong intention passed down to the next generation. For a long time, this knowledge has been transmitted. And so we, we don't want to be that generation that's, um, you know, the last one to do that ancient tea recipe and have it be lost. We want to uphold what our ancestors have, you know, um, handed down to us over time. That's our, that's our legacy and that's our inheritance. And so we also have a poster in here called Feeding Seven Generations. And, uh, you know, we get asked time and time again around how we can, um, how we can eat like our ancestors, basically, in a modern world. Um, it's inspired by a conversation I had with a, my, one of my sweetest teachers. Um, he's passed away, but Hank Gobin from Tulalip, who told me, uh, you know, I really want to support you and I'm really excited about, you know, you out there in the world getting more people to eat traditional foods, but how do you do that when nowadays our traditional and accustomed harvesting grounds are Safeway and Albertsons and QFC and these large grocery markets? Um, how do you bring your ancestor grocery shopping with you? And so um, it kind of inspired us to think about how the these common concepts are coming out of these conversations with elders and native food practitioners throughout our region that are as applicable today as they were generations ago. And, um, and so how do we eat like our ancestors? We, we can um, eat more whole foods. Uh, you know, when you're grocery shopping, a blueberry is a blueberry is a blueberry, right? There's no, you don't need a science degree to understand what's in the blueberry. It just is itself. That's what a whole food is, or trying to eat things as close to a whole food status as possible. Um, to eat more plants, that is the one thing that all nutritionists can agree on. We all need to eat more plants and a lot less meat. I think we have a meat heavy diet and we know that that has environmental ramifications as well. Um, to diversify your diet that, you know, um, for the Coast Salish people, our ancestors were eating over 300 different kinds of foods in a calendar year. That's very different from the standard American diet that is just 12 to 20 foods. We go to the grocery store and we have the illusion of di diversity, but what we're seeing are the same three to four products packaged and shaped in different ways. Corn, soy, pea protein I'm seeing a lot of nowadays. Um, those things are in almost everything in the grocery store. And so eating, our, eating more a diversity of foods, um, 
maybe not just sticking to the, the typical like hot dog hamburger situation, but trying different things and different cultural um, recipes as well will help. Um, also, we hear this time and time again, how important it is to cook and eat with good intention. And um, cooking, yes, you know, I've learned that I don't want to be making my um, soup listening to democracy now at the same time because I'm serving that up to my family. <laughs> that kind of political um, rage sometimes that we have, but also to um, to eat with good intention. That eating is a reminder that we as pitiful humans rely on foods to exist and um, and that the standard you know uh, American is eating at least one meal a day, um, a week in their vehicles, traveling from one place to the next. Now that probably looks different in the time of COVID, but, um, and I am seeing a lot more people cooking at home, which is really amazing. But when we sit down to eat, it is so important to practice the rest and digest part of our nervous system. Um, it is a time when we can turn off that stress hormone, uh, cortisol, which is like the number one contributor to all uh, inflammation in the body. And that's the fight or flight, you know, part. So if you're driving down the road and someone slams on their brakes in front of you, that cortisol is right up in your system and it circulates there for 24 hours. Um, and so we don't want to be trying to eat our Arby's five for five while our body is telling us that a gorilla is chasing us through the jungle. <laughs> we want to sit down at a table and just simply enjoy a meal. And why not talk about our day with our family or, you know, uh, share your thoughts or um, emotions around it. Sharing a meal with people is incredible medicine in and of itself. And then finally, to give back to the land always, that um, we aren't just taking, we're also tending to, um, to the things that uphold our health and that we organize our life and shape our world with. So caring for the land helps us um, to remember the practices of our ancestors and to continue to pass down a world that supports generations to come. And that's, that's what feeding our seven generations is all about. Um, so I'm gonna shut up now and <laughs> see if maybe Jonathan or Olani wanna help sort of field any questions that um, people might have. We've got about 20 minutes left. Um, and yeah, I'd love to hear from all of you. I feel like this is really transactional and it's not how I usually teach, but um, it's what we make do with these days. So um, thank you very much, everybody. And I look forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Uh, we would like people to submit que questions through the chat function. So if you haven't used it before, in the very bottom of the screen, right in the middle, there's a chat button. If you click on that, you will see a little box and in the bottom of it where it says type message here, please go ahead and type your question. Um, also, <clears throat> we at Nakani would like to know who you are in addition. So I'm going to put up a little screen asking, asking for a little bit of information from each of you. So go ahead and type your question. We'll, we'll, you know, Valerie will be able to see it and then she can answer it. And meanwhile, if you'd also answer our question about you. So hang on. Should I stop sharing my screen now? Um, just leave it up for a bit. I'm just going to share for one minute. Okay. Okay. Valerie, can you, you can see the chat, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think because I'm sharing. So can everybody see the chat? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just wondering like, what does people, what do people see? So, um, they want to know out of all the cheese, what is your favorite to make? Oh, I, um, Nettle, the nettle infusion, especially now when I'm, you know, like we're doing a lot of Zoom meetings now. And so I make a big batch that lasts about three days. And then I crawl to my fridge after every Zoom usually. And, and I'll get a, a cup of cold nettle infusion. It's so good right now. And then to prepare the nettle, um, you use gloves, correct? And then strip off the... Um the uh, spiny areas? So um, 
if you were to be harvesting them for tea right now, yes, if you want to have a good experience, you would want to wear some gloves and have a pair of clean scissors. And then you just, um, you hold up your basket or your brown paper bag and just snip the leaves right into it. Uh, and then you just, every day, you want to flip that bag over, sort of fluff up your basket. And within, I don't know, 10 days at the most, they'll dry out pretty good. And then you, you want to dry them out in the bag? Yeah, you can just dry them out right in the bag. And then you just, you know, if you don't have fancy, I, you know, I practice this all the time. So I've got big, large glass jars. Like if you get those big pickle jars at the store, you can save those and clean them out really well and then store your plants in there. They store really well, but you don't want to put them in, in the sunlight because the sun will will bleach out the color and they just won't look as um, as vital. So if you don't want to do all that, you just clip them in a bag, flip the bag over until they're dried, and then roll your bag up and put it in a cool dark place. Make sure. Oh. You yeah. And someone also asks, um, do you have any ideas on how to grow nettle in a garden so not to get stung every time you walk by? <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> um, you know, nettles were cultivated here. In fact, there are some ethnobotanical records that talk about um, families off of the south end of Whidbey Island maintaining, Coast Salish families, maintaining um, up to five acres of nettles, like fertilizing them with seaweeds and salmon carcasses. Ooh. So they are, you know, they're a farmable crop, I guess, if that's what you want to, you know, call yes. it. Um, yes. You totally grow them. Like just and then, um, the seeds are coming out soon, so you can just harvest oh. seeds and sprinkle those on the ground, and they'll grow. They're natives, right? And then, which native plants do you recommend adding to your garden? A lot of the ones that that are here. So, um, I mean, your neighbors will love you if you just plant nettles. <laughs> 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 you could do wild strawberry. You could buy blueberry varieties and really geek out on the blueberry varieties um, that are uh, as close to a native as possible in your in your area. I and how about herbs? Yeah, I have. Um, oh my gosh, I have lemon balm and chamomile and peppermint going bananas in my garden. Um, we've also got wild onion that grows like crazy too. Uh, you won't be able to get rid of it actually. <laughs> tiny little, they're called hooker's onions. Um, they produce seeds like crazy and they just keep coming back year after year after year. They've taken over my asparagus. And I'm trying to think of wild rose. I, I had a little clipping that I put in my, I had uh, about 10 little tiny clippings that I rooted out last year. And um, and they've taken over. A, I've made a whole hedge of wild rose now. Oh wow! These things are really, and they're you know. I'm always reminding my husband that you don't need to water them. In fact, <laughs> you don't want to because that means that they get to stand up to the elements, and their medicine is stronger. You know than a cultivated variety where you kind of have to dote on them and pinch them, and you know you don't really need to do the the whole water addicted plant thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And there's another question. Have you noticed any difference between the nutrients in plants in your garden as opposed to ones found in the wild? That's by Marissa. I, I haven't. Um, I mean, there are certain patches that we go to for you know, certain huckleberries because some of them taste more like pears if they have a pear oh. or some of them there, there's a patch that we have. It's our super secret patch, but it tastes like a banana, a, a huckleberry that has like a banana essence in it. It's really interesting. Um, so I totally subscribe to that idea that plants grown in different areas taste differently. And, and then um, huckleberries, I understand they only really grow in the mountains and so I don't know can we actually plant huckleberry down here in Seattle or mm -hmm. in the northwest? Evergreen huckleberry is a variety that's native here it's um, 
the, the Suquamish, for example, that's uh, the huckleberry that they have. Um, and then there is also the high mountain variety of huckleberry, which only grows at higher elevations. And I think that's a, that what you're referring to. But evergreen huckleberry is the last berry to, um, to fruit of all of the huckleberries uh, usually comes out in like October, November and usually harvested like in right after the first frost because they get sweeter after that. And they they produce um, and they grow really easily too. And how would you uh, recommend planting, like trying to find like a, cut, a, a cutting or, mm. and then plant it in a small container and then put it outside later after it grows more? Yeah, absolutely. Also, a lot of the native plant societies or conservation district, the King County Conservation District has a big plant sale every year. Evergreen huckleberries are always on the list and it's like 10 plants for $10. Wonderful. And do you have their website you can put in the chat? Um, yeah, I think so. Or, you know. Let me look it up here really quick. I think it's Case King County kccd.org, I'm pretty sure. Oh, here's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, they're all wonderful, but this one's pretty detailed. Um, they have Highline teachers benefited the most in a powerful way last summer at the Muckleshoot STI Outdoor Learning experiential PD with you and the MIT cultural programs leaders. What are your recommendations for integrating all of this remarkable plant knowledge in our science, environmental learning, ELA, and beyond spaces in school districts and help teachers to teach it to all students in K through 12 classrooms? How can we integrate this in a major way? Hi, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, we had a really fun time last summer, and uh, and so I spent the last several years trying to really build out these strategies, and it's real, but it's just like, it's a big, a big major system to take on, um, but we're doing our, the best we can. So uh, Elise Crone, uh, my colleague, and I call her my work wife, basically. <laughs> She's, we've um, developed out the Cedar Box Teaching Toolkit as a curriculum that uh, we're talking with OSPI right now about how to get those materials out right away because, um, because people are doing more online learning and stuff. And um, the 10 Gather Grow curriculum that's coming out of GRUB, Garden Raise Bounty, which is an organization in um, Olympia that Elise works for. And I know I love Grub too. They do such really good work. And they actually have a lot of uh, work around training teachers to work with at-risk youth through gardening. Um, if you have a web or a website or a link for Grub, that way people on the, on the chat, that'd be great. Garden Rays Bounty in Olympia. Um, Oh, I'm sending things privately to somebody. I'm just noticing. God, I'm just... <laughs> Go ahead and send it to everybody. I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Garden Raised Bounty out of Olympia, Washington. Okay. Great. And then there was another question about... Um... Thanks, Jonathan. I learned about how healthy native plants like nettle and dandelion leaves are so useful. Um, and um, now dandelion, the yellow part of the dandelion, that's also edible. And um, now that's the flower or is that the flowering or the leaves part? Every part of the dandelion is um, edible. edible. Yep. And so, right. So they, they sort of follow. I love dandelion because it teaches us how to follow the seasons and the vitality of plants. So in the spring that that fresh tender green comes out and um, I I spent a couple of years in uh, living in Greece and um, when that would happen every year even the Greeks would go nuts over um, 
fresh dandelion leaves. It was like their seasonal attunement that, you know, they'd just be drawn to. But um, you can harvest them and they, and they would saute them in a pan with garlic and tons of olive oil and Yum. lemon juice over them. It was so mm. good. I call it pork that. And um, it was controversial. I've heard different, like, it, wild spring greens that were used for that is either amaranth greens, which also grow crazy all over the place in the North American continent, or dandelion greens. Both were used in Horta dishes. Um, and so anyways, yes, the fresh tender greens are edible and then it shoots up its uh, flower and you can harvest the, the um, dandelion flower and eat it fresh, put it into, sprinkle it into salads, uh, make dandelion fritters out of it. We have a recipe for that in the Feeding Seven Generations cookbook. Good. Uh, you can make it dry it out, make them make a tea out of it. And then dandelion leaf gets more fibrous, just like nettle over time. And you can harvest the leaf for tea. And then in the fall, all the vitality of the dandelion goes back to the root. And that's when we're all putting our gardens to bed. So it's a good time to harvest your dandelion roots so you have less next year. Um, but dandelion roots are really great for liver support. People who are like in their head a lot and just yeah. out of their mind, dandelion root is really rooting. You know, helps kind of put you back into your gut, your gut mind. Um, yes. So yeah, you can eat, you can eat the whole thing. And there's another question about um, evergreen huckleberries. Um, this person, Natasha, has a lot in her yard. Uh, do you have any suggested recipes, or is that in the Feeding Seven Generations Astalia's cookbook? The um, recipes for huckleberry? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, I'm trying to remember if there's a huckleberry recipe in there. I think we have like a huckleberry fizz soda and oh it's in the smoothie recipes um, and then I mean sometimes we just do uh, if we're doing like a demonstration around huckleberries in class we'll do a um, what is it called like a berry cobbler so oh. in a pan and then just put some oats on the top and butter because that's a vitamin in my life and then bake it bake it off for people it's i mean my kids we have to like ration our huckleberries <laughs> the end of the year. but um you can eat them fresh you can put them in sodas soda water um you can put them in water you can boil them and make a syrup a really simple syrup um to put on anything you want um I'm trying to think. Oh, my colleague Elizabeth Campbell made a huckleberry shrub, which is actually in the the picture that that last picture I had Mazzy drinking a little cup of something. Um, so huckleberry shrubs or even just shrubs are really good for you. They're um, like sort of a vinegar based soda, but they help balance gut health and the huckleberry one was the best one I've ever had. Wow. And then there was another question is, um, can you give a few more details on harvesting protocols? Um, and then um, Robin Wall Kimmer calls them honorable harvest. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see. I mean, <clears throat> I think that the, the, there are so many. So you want to make sure that you're harvesting in an area that's clean right? Like I, I'll drive down the road and see um, plants in the ditch that are look incredible, but kind of don't really want to be harvesting from um, areas that are, you know, heavily trafficked that, you know, ha have hydrocarbons flying off the road <laughs> near it that right. might be near, you know, um, toxic sites. So you want to make sure you're harvesting from clean areas you um, typically people will bring an offering. So that could be, you know, watering the plant or picking up some garbage around or offering so t some tobacco or prayer. Um, when I harvest, I always think about how I want people to feel when they're um, 
when they're ingesting what I'm harvesting. I want it to be medicine and I talk to the plant, you know, sometimes out loud, sometimes in my head, just saying like, I'm going to harvest you and this is, I need your help being good medicine for, you know, people that need this and, um, and I will honor you in the best way. And so that you're holding that really good intention around your medicine. And then I never take too much, you know, I, you really follow the practice of not wanting people to even know you're ever there. So if they are coming in and they're, and they're clearly seeing like nettles snipped right off the top buzz cut, like that's probably not a good harvesting practice. Yes. Um, and then there are also little tricks like um, always cutting at an angle. So if I'm harvesting nettles, for example, I wouldn't want to cut it straight at the top because if rain fell, the water would just sit at the top and disease the plant. And so if you harvest at an angle and you only take the first two um, from the first top two tiers, then the plant will have um, enough energy to sprout out two more. And, uh, and so the way in which we harvest can help amplify future harvesting opportunities. And um, I had one more. Well, I mean, really, the, the, like if you've never done it before and you want to get out there, the best thing to do is to bring someone with you who has and so that they have a chance to really show you the correct plant, the right way to harvest, things to look out for and make sure that you're safe. That's just sort of the overall, you know, food safety standard when it comes to harvesting. Yes. And there's another question. Is there any website that you recommend with information on how to identify native plants? Hmm, um, the Burke Museum actually has a really great um, plant database. And um, Elise has a blog, I think it's up, it's called wildfoodsandmedicines.com. And she does a really good job at covering um, many of the plants that um, we teach about. Great. Because it might be dot org. Okay, I think we have about three more minutes. Um, is there any other thing that you'd like to add? Is there um, one of the uh, questions also um, uh, is on um, the oil spills and the impact on oil spills to the um, water and the soil and the plants and the air. Yeah, um, a couple of the articles that Jonathan had sent me, which I really appreciate being able to study up on. Um, we're talking about the pipeline going, the Canadian um, pipeline and the disruption to the shellfish, uh, the shellfish beds. And I just, you know, really wanted, and that's why I started out in this way, I really wanted to say, you know, those, those shellfish are so important to cleaning up the environment. The, the average clam or mussel filters about 40 gallons of water a day. It balances the pH in the water. They're, they're not just something that people would sort of schlep out the shores and harvest. They, they were also um, clam gardens. And if you Google clam gardens, you'll see all the reports that have been written up more recently from archaeologists that there were these myths, you know, of clam gardens existing. And somebody accidentally took an aerial shot and found this terrace that had been built. So people would push boulders down to the farthest um, line on the shore and build a terrace. And then the um, water would come and naturally seed it so that it was a sandy, easy harvest of clams. People maintain that for a long time. And so to just like blast through, you know, an ancient garden uh, just to get oil to a place without permission is so, so rude and um, just un, just totally disregarding an entire ecosystem that's been here before humans. I mean, clams are one of the oldest um, things on the planet, but also the kelp and the seaweed that's there and how nutrient dense they are. All the things that I talked about today, um, nettle doesn't even get close to the amount of nutrients that are in kelp and um, nori and sea lettuce and all of those other um, sort of forgotten, you know, traditional foods, our sea vegetables were an integral part of our diet. And now 
we don't even know if we can eat the seaweeds in the Puget Sound because it's so contaminated. And so we look to those northern waters and that's what really concerns me about what's happening in, um, in those areas. Yes, thank you so much. And one last uh, comment here, uh, Klecko Klecko uh, from uh, Charlotte Cote, she loved your presentation. Many of the attendees today are students from her AIS number 270, Native Peoples of the Northwest Coast class. Oh, all so right. they, we're raising our hands to them and to you. Well, thank, you. The time. <laughs> thank you for geeking out with me and, um, and letting <laughs> me do this. I, I miss it. I miss seeing everybody and, and being able to, you know, come talk about these things with you. Great. And then um, Jonathan, uh, he will be uh, preparing the, uh, the recording here and then placing it on our website um, so that uh, you people can listen to this again and look at all the wonderful resources and the wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Gunishjish, that's a clink up word that means thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Stay safe out there and take care of yourself. Hi, Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so much fun to see people. All right, well, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Valerie, for your fabulous presentation. We will, I will, I will make a video of this. I'll edit it a little bit, um, add, add title slides and stuff like that, and then it'll be up on our webpage in the next day or two, nakani.org, N-A-K-A-N-I.org. And uh, yeah, and we do have another event coming up on June 12th, which will be about climate uh, climate justice, basically, as Native Native peoples and Indigenous peoples are affected. Uh, we don't ha have details quite put together yet, but that will be announced soon. Uh, and then I was just mentioning in the chat, we have a loving kindness meditation session every weekday morning from 9 to 9.45. And you can get the link again from our Facebook page. So again, thanks for everyone to, for participating. We look forward to seeing you at future events. Take care. Thank you. Good